Hi there, good afternoon. I'm Dr. Nahid Bedelia. I'm an infectious diseases physician at Boston Medical Center and the medical director of the Special Pathogens Unit. I'm an associate professor at the Boston University School of Medicine. So over the last decade or so, my work has been working on providing care to patients with highly infectious, you know, emerging infectious diseases. And I've been working on outbreaks and, and how we can avoid them, how we can respond to them both here and, and, and abroad. And I've been part of the Ebola response in West Africa. Um, and in the last couple of de the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Ebola virus disease outbreaks have been part of the response on the Uganda side. And during the COVID uh, times, I have been working as a frontline physician um, and I have been advising my hospital as well as all of you in terms of how to how do we survive this uh, with our health and our sanity. So I welcome you to ask me anything about COVID. And, and with that, we'll jump right in and, and see what the first question is. So, hello, I'm Karen. Why don't we play the video? I think, uh, let's see what, what we've have recorded and then we'll go to the live question. Hello, I'm Karen Tursak, president of the Willoughby Western Lake County Chamber of Commerce, tuning in from Willoughby, Ohio. And my question for Dr. Vidalia is, if you are fully vaccinated, can you be a carrier of the virus? Karen, that's a great question. And the data on this has been really promising recently. And so what we know is that in the vaccine trials, such as Moderna, such as uh, just as the work from, from Novavax and Johnson & Johnson, we've seen that when patients, and AstraZeneca rather, I should say, uh, what we've seen is that patients who received their first dose, when they came back for their second dose, when they were tested, there was a two thirds reduction of, of people who had any kind of infection, even without symptoms, right? The concern is that you could get a vaccine and maybe you don't get any symptoms, but you could be a carrier because enough of the virus replicates in your airway so that if you're around other people, you might be able to transmit it to them. The, the, the most promising data is actually coming since the vaccines have been released, uh, data from Israel, there was a study from Mayo Clinic, and then most recently the CDC released a study of frontline healthcare workers. And in all of those cases, what we saw, the most recent study in, in CDC showed that there was almost a 80% decrease in all infections. You know, any symptomatic infections or any infections where you may not be aware that you have the infections or asymptomatic infections, 80% decrease after first dose and 90% decrease after second dose for the mRNA vaccines that are out there, which means that it's most likely that people who are vaccinated, their risk of trans transmitting the disease to others decreases drastically. And that's good news. The only thing that we want to just be uh, you know, cautious about is that as new variants spread, we know that one of the things that they're doing is potentially decreasing the efficacy of the vaccines, particularly for symptomatic, uh, symptomatic, you know, infections. So they're protecting you against hospitalizations and, and deaths and severe disease, but it may be that they, because of the new variants, there might be a little bit more room of you getting symptomatic infections or having potentially higher amounts of virus in your airway if you get infected after a vaccine. And that's why we're all being extra careful currently um, in, in following the CDC guidance. In, in making sure that we're not gathering in large groups um, and all the other elements in terms of wearing a mask when we're around people who are not vaccinated. So here's the next question, which I think might be related to that, which is what is the best COVID-19 vaccine to take and how long do you think before the pandemic is over? This is from Frederick and, and Georgia State University. Uh, Frederick, I think I'll, I will echo what others have said, which is uh, the best vaccine is the one that you can get today uh, for a couple of reasons. So one is all, as I said, all the vaccines that are currently uh, approved, the Johnson & Johnson, which is one dose, the Moderna and the Pfizer, which are two doses, all seem to reduce chances of severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and in just to, you know, people sort of look at the numbers and trials and sort of are stuck on the fact that there might be higher numbers in in some of the, the vaccine trials for mRNA versus the Johnson & Johnson, the, the thing to consider is that you as an individual has a slightly different profile than everybody else. So when you get a vaccine, the way the vaccine looks in you may look different. And so from that perspective, the fact that all vaccines protect against severe disease and, and hospitalizations and deaths, and two, the fact that we know um, that variants, as I said, could affect vaccines uh, effectiveness, and hence we will likely need boosters down the road for all of us. Uh, today's path to, to for, for normalcy is as many people getting vaccinated. Um, and by doing that, we protect ourselves. But because vaccines are reducing transmission, we keep the amount of virus in the community down, which means that 
any one of us individually are at less chance of coming across uh, someone who has COVID-19, if that makes sense. Um, so in terms of your question about the return to normalcy, I, I think it's going to be, you know, I think the director, Rochelle Walensky, has said this, and I think that this is probably the right way to think about it, is that it's not going to be a flip switch. It's going to be more of a dial as we return back to normal. And you're, the first sign of normalcy that I hope to see is that as more of us get vaccinated, the cases go start going down and hospitalizations and deaths continue to go down. And that's not, if you remember, compared to where we were in November and December, um, and even the earlier surges, that is a sign of normalcy when our healthcare systems can return to normal and we're already potentially getting there as long as we can stay ahead of these spikes that we're seeing from B117 and some of the other transmissible, highly transmissible variants. The other signs of, of, of normalcy that we're seeing is, is the things that vaccinated people can do. We already know that we've seen guidance from um, CDC that people who are vaccinated um, can gather in small groups without masks on with other people who are vaccinated, or they can gather um, indoors with one other household where there are no members who are high risk, you know, even if they have not been vaccinated. If you're a grandparent that's vaccinated, you can visit a, a, your 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 nuclear family, your, you know, your, your children's family, if, if none of those members uh, are high risk and are not um, are not vaccinated, and the guidance is still that if you are if you're not in one of those groups, uh, if you're potentially visiting somebody who's high risk, you you continue to wear that mask. The next steps I think you might see is that as cases keep going down, and it's interesting today, Dr. Walensky brought up something that Dr. Fauci had discussed during the summer. What we want to see is the total amount of cases in the communities go down. Right now, we are about sixty thousand cases uh, daily. And they talked about numbers such as even 5,000 or 10,000 cases daily. When you get to that point, I think that you know it's likely the CDC um, and the U.S. government, the federal government, is going to feel a lot more comfortable passing guidelines uh, that say you know you could now do uh, bigger gatherings than what we were before. That you you might be able to get back to some semblance of normalcy, such as gathering with your friends, you know, in indoors with for a dinner party, or 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 you know what Dr. Ja has she has often mentioned, which is having small backyard uh, barbecues, you know, uh, with, with friends as well. So summer is going to see us do that. I think that you probably will see greater number of people traveling once that more people have been vaccinated by, by summer, um, early fall. I think the normalcy, the complete normalcy, um, question is, do we want to go back to complete normalcy where people came in sick, you know, to work? I hope some things that lessons that we take from this pandemic is, is how do we improve, um, you know, the lessons that we learn, like, you know, staying home when you're sick or wearing a mask if you go outside if you're sick um, and, and things along those lines. The normalcy for the rest of the world, unfortunately, is going to be much, uh, much longer because vaccinating the rest of the world may take years and that might affect our ability to travel or interact um, or, or ability to sort of get back to normalcy because we'll be worried that there might be transmission in other parts of the world. So I hope that helps. What's the next question? Will the COVID vaccine most likely be one that needs to be administered semi-annually or annually comparable to the sh uh, flu shot? Uh, so Tony, currently the we know that there is a booster on the horizon because we know that there are variants that decrease the efficacy of the current vaccines. Um, and both Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, all three of them have started working on these potential boosters uh, that address those particular variants. Um, whether or not and how many years we we need to have sort of semi most likely annual or maybe even less than that vaccinations uh, depends on how much continued transmission of the virus there is in the world because the more this virus replicates the more chances there are there will mutate and the more it mutates the more likely it is that it might find a you know a variant that works for it evolution has an evolutionary uh, ev evolutionary advantage and hence um, it, it sort of uh, it is likely that then you might see variants pop up that are a threat and may reduce the efficacy of our vaccines. Uh, but no fear, because we now have the technology and we've proven the safety of the technology, the vaccine technology. So even if that happens, we can quickly adapt our vaccines to address those variants. Um, it is unlikely, though, you know, people have talked about whether you're going to be eradicating COVID-19 or not. It's probably unlikely that in the short term, we're going to eradicate uh, SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19 entirely from the face of the world, because there's just so much of that virus. But but that's the hope. Maybe five, 10 years down the road, you know, this thing becomes either completely manageable 
um, or it, it becomes something that just disappears off the face of the earth. Right now, the goal is going to be to get it to a point where it's a much less mortality, much, much fewer hospitalizations, and people are healthy um, for the most part, except for some mild symptoms if they end up getting it. What's the next question? Are there, has there been any testing of new COVID vaccines for people who are auto, who have autoimmune diseases? Uh, so Beverly, the, the most common group that's been tested has been HIV. Uh, there have been other patients with autoimmune diseases, but not in large numbers in the vaccine trials. Currently having an autoimmune disease is in fact not a contraindication. And so you should discuss it uh, with your with your physician, uh, whether or not you should be taking the vaccines. But prior history of, of uh, autoimmune diseases or current autoimmune diseases actually put you at potentially a greater risk of having a more severe COVID-19 course. And that's why it is, it is important for people to get vaccinated. However, for, for particular incidents and particular conditions, I, I encourage you to talk to your physicians um, to see if, uh, if, if you should be taking the COVID vaccine. I would highly encourage all my patients uh, who are in that category to get it. The concern though, is that even after the vaccine, you wanna ensure uh, that you, you are protecting yourself, particularly if your immune system um, is is not as as revved up as maybe you know other people's immune systems maybe because you, you you if you end up getting an infection you will still be protected uh, it may be that you may be less protected than other people um, who who do not have that condition next question good morning my name is peter weber with winged beaver strategies in washington dc my question this morning is if enough americans don't get vaccinated Will the will the virus just continue to mutate and spread? What will happen? Yeah, Peter, this keeps me awake um, as well. So there's some good news on this front, which we, which is that there's a Kaiser Family Foundation survey that says that the the people who had said they wanted to wait and see whether they wanted to get vaccinated or are you know or not that number is getting smaller. So there is a there the people who are on the fence, the number of that seems to be going down as we're getting more experience and millions of us are getting vaccinated with these with these safe, safe vaccines. And so I, I do hope that we um, end up reaching a point where there's not an issue, but vaccine hesitancy is of a concern because um, you know that's gonna delay for the reasons you talked about, because uh, if there is a huge segment of our population where this virus continues to transmit, then you may end up seeing potential increased evolution. And that's not just our population, but globally, if you keep seeing this virus transmit, the concern is if there aren't enough vaccinated people, that it will start to take a foothold and, and potentially develop new variants. Uh, there is there is some you know, concern here in the US for me, what I'm, the, the thing, the thought that I've had is that there might be communities and even states that do a very good job of achieving herd immunity, right? Large numbers of people accept it, particularly in, 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 in some areas compared to others. And there might be other areas, geographical areas, where people who are hesitant may be in the same communities. And so you might see larger numbers of people not get vaccinated in those communities. And hence, it, you might see outbreaks of COVID-19 in those communities where the vaccination rates are low, as we've seen with other diseases such as measles. You know, before COVID-19, we were seeing um, outbreaks of measles, a vaccine preventable disease in, in Oregon and California and communities where, you know, there's a lot of sharing of potentially misinformation and disinformation about the measles vaccines and the rates were going down a vaccination to a point where all of a sudden measles, which we, we thought we had controlled, uh, was becoming a threat again. And so that's the concern with COVID-19 is that all of a sudden you might get to a, a point in the United States where you may have communities that have achieved that. And then you might have herd immunity, and then you might have communities that might the nation where we'll still have to sort of, you know, we'll still see uh, some of these infections end up in hospitalizations and deaths and outbreaks happen, and potentially the continued evolution of that virus, which might pose a threat for everybody else as well. Does COVID nineteen affect uh, have any effect on the reproductive system? So James, the, 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 for pregnancy, the, for pa patients who are pregnant, what we know is that if you end up getting COVID-19 while you're pregnant, you're likely to have a more severe course of this disease compared to those who, who don't have, um, who don't have, who are not pregnant. And so that's why it's important. I think the data, as the data is coming out in terms of safety of these vaccines in pregnant women, I think, you know, it's important um, to talk about why pregnant women should 
highly consider potentially having this vaccine after discussion with their with their OBGYN. Um, so the, the 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 concerns that I have seen is not so much the COVID, but there's a lot of disinformation and misinformation about COVID vaccine affecting fertility. So there is no data that any of the COVID vaccines or really even any of the other vaccines that are currently approved have any impact on long-term fertility in males or females. I think some of the reasons this confusion came out, I had a listener uh, previously sent me a note saying that one of the reasons that there was this confusion was that when, when we started talking about vaccines, uh, scientists were talking about the concept of sterilizing immunity. So sterilizing immunity is a technical term which says if you get a vaccine, you you are able to have enough immunity that you don't allow the the, vac the 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 virus to replicate in your airway. So basically, you've been able to sterilize your airways from that virus ability, virus's ability to take hold. But when people you know hear sterilizing, I think the, there was a lot of confusion about well, well, does that refer to how we generally use that term, which is reproductive system? And so I want to take this time to. Again, underscore, when people talk about sterilizing immunity, it's a technical term that they're using to define a type of immune response. It has nothing to do with reproductive system or sterilization. And there's no evidence that the COVID-19 vaccines affect uh, fertility in males or females. Uh, but in general, in terms of COVID itself as a disease affecting male and female um, reproductive systems, we don't know yet. We do know that in pregnancy, it can cause a more severe course and potentially have some adverse effects uh, for the baby as well, uh, such as such as preterm labor. Labor. Next question. What is your opinion on fully vaccinated people infecting non-vaccinated? How will uh, how will science determine this? So Kate, this is the, the, the question that we had start, started talking about at the very beginning that I am the most excited about, which is the evidence that we're now seeing, which is uh, testing people who've been vaccinated to see, there are a couple of pieces of information that we have. So I mentioned the CDC trial um, or CDC study that looked at frontline healthcare workers that showed that people who are vaccinated have a reduction in all types of infection, which means that it's likely that if you don't get if you don't get infected, you're not likely to transmit it. So if the rates of your infections are low, it is likely um, the rates of your transmission are low as well. But there's some other promising data as well. There are studies that have shown that people who are vaccinated, even if they get infected, the amount of virus in their airway tends to be much lower than people who are not vaccinated. Um, and so there is good evidence on the fact that there is a reduction in transmission. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, the only reason we're being cautious, you know, extra cautious right now, uh, is simply because there are there's a huge chunk of us that are still not vaccinated, and there might be a concern that with variants you you may see uh, potential for for some of those rates of infections going up compared to with the wild type virus. Any updates on uh, time for immunity following full vaccine? So Dr. Fauci actually mentioned that today, and there's been some studies on this, Joseph, recently as well. So what we know for, I'll start first with natural immunity, like after, after infection. So not quite natural because you don't actually want the disease, but immunity after natural infection, what we know is that there's antibodies that people have up to up to eight, eight months or so, six months in, in patients who've had more mild disease, but if you've been hospitalized, potentially, uh, potentially higher. The trouble with natural immunity is that the, over time, your antibodies start going down. And also there is a concern that you know the variants, some of the variants that are out there, the B one three five one or the, the the variant that was initially discovered in Brazil, P one. Um, you're seeing um, potentially higher rates of reinfection with those variants in people who've had um, who've had prior infection with the wild type virus. And so it may be that because the rates of antibodies that are created after uh, after in natural immunity are lower than what you see after vaccines that it's likely the vaccines are gonna be a lot more protective. And that's what we've seen in, in studies is that vaccines tend to be a lot more protective um, against the new variants um, as compared to just having natural immunity. So from vaccines, the latest data is that there was a study that was put out from Pfizer that looked at six months out, very strong antibody responses. But just bear in mind, you know, right, it's not been that long since many of us have gotten the vaccine. It is likely and in, in, in general agreement is that if you get vaccinated, it is very likely that that immunity lasts for a while, you know, um, and, and so it's hard to tell for how long um, because it's not just the antibodies that decide the immunity. It's also 
also your immune memory cells, T cells that decide it. And, and it is likely that it will the, the, the immunity from vaccination lasts even longer than what we see from, from, from immunity from natural infections. We just don't know. Um, and I'd hate to take a gander, but you know, I, I would, I would, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some level of immunity even a year out. But, but I, 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 we just don't know. That's just something that we have to sort of take a look um, and 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 document. I think from studies. I've been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, Diana says uh, several times, but have not contracted it. Is my body building immunity despite the fact that I've not been infected? So Diana, great question. So for you to build immunity, you would actually have to be infected. It is possible that you were, two things could have happened. You could have been exposed, but you may not actually, you, you could have been around somebody who had COVID-19 and have, you know, but, but the, you've been lucky that potentially the virus didn't find you. You know, maybe the environment, you were outdoors, maybe you were in close enough contact. So you weren't actually exposed, even though you were close enough to that person. Uh, and but by just, just by luck and chance, you, you were able to escape potentially being exposed to it. The other option is you were exposed to it but maybe the amount of virus was not enough for it to cause an infection in you. Um, particularly if you, if you were wearing a mask, if the distance was long enough, um, it might be that you, you, you were exposed, but the virus never took hold in your, in, your, in your respiratory system. The third option is that you might've gotten it um, and had the infection, but you might've been asymptomatic and you may not have known. So to build immunity, you actually have to have had an exposure and you may not have had a symptoms, but you, you know, technically, medically, when we say you've had an infection, it basically means your immune system encountered it and it built a memory. And that's what an infection is, even if you ended up developing no symptoms. And so for you to have developed immunity, you would have had to had uh, the infection, even if it's an infection without symptoms. And so the best thing I would say is still get vaccinated. Um, and if you haven't, you know, and, and, and continue to wear those masks, if you haven't had a chance to qualify yet for a vaccine, I would not assume that you are at this point immune. Um, and, and because there really aren't very many good tests on the market that help can help you tell you that you in fact, um, have enough of an immunity to protect you next time you are exposed. I hope that's helpful. How effective is the vaccine between doses? What happens if someone gets the vac COVID vaccine in between doses? Should they still get their second dose? So currently, this I'll start with the last question first. Um, currently, the CDC guidance is that you should still get both of your doses, whether or not you've had prior infection, and that includes infection in between doses. Um, if you've gotten the vaccine, right, it, depending on the vaccine that you're looking for, you get partial immunity um, after that first dose. It really is that second dose in mRNA vaccines that really picks up your antibody response and is, is likely to guarantee that you'll have immunity for a longer period of time. In Johnson & Johnson, you get a big, you know, big increase in your antibodies. And then over time, that continues to increase at 45 days. Um, can you get infected? You get partially protected, depending on what you're looking at. You know, if, if the right before you get uh, the second dose, in in some cases, like I said, you know, there's about a the 80 percent protection um, in the mRNAs in the initial trials. It's not taking into account the variants. What I would what I would say is that there is still a chance if your body didn't have enough time right after your first dose to build that immunity, or or you know, you just happen to be unlucky and you got exposed to a lot of virus you might still get sick after your first dose. And it's, it's important to continue taking all the measures until you're completely vaccinated, which is two weeks after the mRNA vaccines um, and two weeks after the one dose of the Johnson & Johnson. Um, but, but the interesting point that you bring up is that there is interesting evidence that shows that people who've had prior infection Right now, they have some amounts of antibodies in their body. If they get one dose, that they actually get a huge amount of immune response. And could that be enough? You know, there there is haven't been trials done on this, and, and it's unlikely currently from what we're hearing from FDA, hearing from FDA and, and the CDC that there'll be a change in guidance. Uh, but but there is some evidence that when you when you've had an infection before, you get the vaccine, you become supercharged. And so you should still go out and, and get that vaccine um, if you've had the infection before, because it's just gonna give you longer term protection, like I said, and, and increase amount of antibodies um, to protect you from the variants as well. What else do we have? Can you get COVID-19 from the vaccine? Absolutely not. So there is no COVID. So the virus that causes COVID-19 is SARS-CoV-2. And there is no SARS-CoV-2 virus in any of the vaccines. 
what the vaccines have is an instruction to build one part as a one protein, the spike protein, that's part of the virus. That is, that's what the virus uses to enter human cells. And so each of the different vaccines that are out there use different kinds of technology to deliver instructions to your cells to build that spike protein, which again, it's just one protein of, you know, of many in that virus. And there's no replication competent virus. There's no virus, SARS-CoV-2, the virus in those vaccines. But what, what you may be referring to is that when people get vaccines, right, you get, you, part of the reason you're getting the vaccine is you're teaching your immune system to build a response. And so when you get a vaccine, you're likely to have those early symptoms such as pain at the site of injection, fevers, chills, my, uh, body aches, muscle aches, and people may feel like they have a viral infection, but that's actually not a viral infection. What that is, is, is your immune system, you know, going through that, that battle uh, battle testing and that training so that next time you are exposed to the real virus, it recognizes that spike protein and is able to mount a strong response enough so the virus cannot take a foothold. Um, and even if it does, it cannot replicate enough to make you sick uh, from, from the infection. So this is interesting, Sean, the question of, is there any reason not to take uh, Tylenol, acetaminophen, ibuprofen, et cetera, after vaccination to mitigate side effects. Um, so theoretically, right? So what the CDC suggests is that you don't take it before you get the vaccine because you want to try to create an immune response. And some of some of these medications, the Tylenol, the ibuprofen, tend to um, they tend to decrease inflammation, right? And so part of that immune response is creating that inflammation so you get a memory. However, after, you know, after you've gotten the vaccine, if you end up developing adverse effects, you should, uh, the CDC guidance currently says, you can go ahead and take those over-the-counter measures um, and, and hydrate, um, uh, rather um, over-the-counter medications and then hydrate um, so that your symptoms can be, can be decreased. Now, if you were to ask me and, and you know, for no other reason except for there is a, a bit more anti-inflammatory component to ibuprofen compared to acetaminophen, um, I generally recommend that if you're gonna take something on the day of after you've, developed, after you've gotten the vaccine and you've developed the symptoms from the vaccine, um, I lean towards Tylenol or acetaminophen over the ibuprofen, but probably it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Uh, but just wait until after the vaccine um, so that your body has that, that chance to build that inflammation and, and that immune response. What are your tips for maintaining increasing mental health as the pandemic continues? Yeah, this is incredibly important and I'm glad we're, we're ending on this because you know the rates of depression and anxiety um, have increased throughout this entire year. And I've seen this not just through this pandemic, but you know, uh, part of my work during the West African Ebola virus disease epidemic, as well as the outbreaks that I've been in in the past, when your entire you know normalcy changes, when 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 you see how we live our, live our lives change, uh, your body will respond, right? Your 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 mind and your body will respond together, and and. I think that we're we're going to need a lot more mental health resources, and I hope that we see that investment from states. I hope we see that investment from hospitals and reaching out to their patients. Um, and if you are someone who's experiencing those symptoms, I, I highly recommend um, you take advantage of, of the resources that are available. Um, one thing that I do is is still go out there, you know, go outdoors, um, exercise. Um, it is safer outdoors to gather outdoors than it is indoors. I have been meeting um, colleagues, one or two friends. I would meet them throughout this pandemic outdoors at a social distance for picnics, and that's how I've kept my sanity and and you know been uh, been able to sort of get through this. Is is we wear masks, we keep physically distant, and we do a picnic, uh, and we take our masks off when we're farther apart and outdoors, and that reduces the chance of transmission. Um, but the other things that people I know have done is taken up hobbies and exercising. Uh, but but truly, I think that we're, all of us are going to feel this, and it's okay to feel this because we've all gone through a huge shock that has changed the shape of our world. Um, but we're almost there. Just hang in there a bit longer. We're almost on the other side of this. So thank you for, for having me and, and I'm, I'm happy to continue answering your questions on Twitter. Um, and thank you for Chamber of Congre uh, Commerce Foundation for having me today. Thank you.